Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Louis Vive in San Diego, California. Sometimes ultra endurance athlete and always a very curious human being. Today I'm talking with Eric Larson. He wrote the book On Thin Ice and he also made a documentary called Melting, Last Race to the Pole. And what I think is really cool about today's interview is, is that I talked to Eric about how he has figured out a way to take what he loves to do most in this world, which is essentially exploring the ends of the earth, and he's made a living out of it. And I think that there's a lot that we can apply to our everyday life. You know, on top of that, when somebody purposely puts themselves in adverse situations, you know, there's always a lot of takeaways. And that's why people that do that often become uh, authors and speakers, and why I'm so inclined to want to share their story on Lionheart Radio. So I would encourage you to listen to this with a mindset of trying to figure out uh, and apply as much of it as you can to your own pursuits in fitness, no matter what those are. Even if you don't have a high appetite for danger or risk, you know, I think that there's a lot you can take away from this episode. So without further ado, Eric Larson. All right, Eric, thanks for being with me today. Thank you. Appreciate it. So you are our first polar explorer. Is that what you go by? <laughs> you know, <laughs> more or less, yeah, polar explorer, polar adventure. Okay. So there's, we... not, there's not too many out uh, of us out there, so being the first really isn't that hard. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We have some really cool people on Lionheart Radio. I'm, I'm sad to say you're not the first ever summoner, but uh, oh, nice. polar explorer is definitely pretty fucking cool. Can you give the audience a little bit, uh, maybe a rundown of some of the things that you've done and what it is that you do? Yeah, I mean, I uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek say that my wheelhouse is kind of long, freezing, cold suffer fests. So if there's any snow, ice, or cold weather, that's definitely a place that I want to go. But my focus is really po- has been polar expeditions um, and a lot of different styles of expeditions to both the North and South Pole as well as some um, mountaineering trips as well. And so realistically, my goal is to kind of tell stories of what I call the last, gro- freight, uh, the last great frozen places on the planet. Cool. So the first thing you mentioned there is Sufferfest. So somebody like me here, Sufferfest, and I'm like, dude, that sounds cool. <laughs> like, where do I sign yeah. up? However, yeah. as far as marketing goes, I don't know that that is, uh, has a very wide appeal. Um, Why do you think, why is it that you choose Sufferfest in the first place, I guess? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's a good question. I've been trying to figure that one out for a long time. But I think for me, um, you know, I I would say that I have found this pursuit that really fits my kind of skills and interests. And um, I think, you know, the the longer the trip, well, first of all, I like doing expeditions that are kind of more original. I'm, I'm not a guy, you know, if I see 10 people going this way, I'm going to go the other way. And so there's a lot of really amazing adventures, adventures that are out there that either have been done or have a, a really kind of set route or what, even something like Everest, it's very straightforward. Um, and so I'm kind of more drawn to these really vast open spaces where a lot of people aren't and where a lot of people haven't traveled and where it takes a lot more thoughtfulness to not only travel there, but also to plan and prepare. There's not set up logistics. There's not necessarily outfitters that are there. And so it's this big puzzle. And I, and I always describe it. It's a puzzle where you're actually trying to figure out what the picture is Mm. Um, because nobody's given you that whole, like, this is how it all works. Um, And so I think that's really why I'm drawn to these types of adventures and it's, and you know, the longer trips, um, I also like the carefulness that goes into, um, that sustained effort, you know, like we're not sprinting every day and it's not like I'm lifting a gajillion pounds or whatever. Um, but you know, when you're out on the trail for not just a week or two weeks, but nearly two months, there's a lot of, um, uh, kind of energy that goes into being safe, uh, being efficient, and actually having physical energy by the end of the journey. Hmm. When you use a word like suffer, do you find that it does a lot of self-selecting so that you don't have to worry about Because I know that you guide tours and, <laughs> yeah. and things of that yeah. nature. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm like you. Like, I, you know, I, I got into expeditions, one, because I love camping, but I also read a lot of adventure books as a kid and early exploration. And 
And, you know, those early British explorers were like perfect at being uncomfortable and like getting in over their heads. And, you know, I read those accounts and was like, oh, yeah, where do I sign up? Mm. Um, and so the, the idea of suffering is a little bit of a misnomer because like I don't want to suffer. I don't want to be uncomfortable. My goal with what I do is to be, you know, as warm and as comfortable as I can in cold places. That said, it's a roller coaster. You know, there's never any time where like, oh, yeah, this is great. I'm just going to relax right here. Right. But um, it, so I, I, you know, my goal is not necessarily to suffer, but I do like putting myself in situations where you get pushed to that point and, you know, understand, you know, either you make it or you don't. Yeah. Do you know who uh, Colin, Colin O'Brady is? Yeah. I, I actually guided him to the North Pole. Yeah. Oh, on his Beyond 7 too? Yeah. Oh, yep. really yep. cool. For his last degree North Pole trip. Yeah. He's, uh, we've talked a lot. He's a really nice guy. Nice. Okay. So he mentioned, uh, he called it type two fun. And, and he was talking about the fact that while you're doing it, you ask yourself, like, why in the hell am I doing this? And then after it's over, you kind of look back on it with nostalgia. Uh, and you're like, ah, oh, that was really awesome. I should do that again. And so, I, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I identify or, with that. Yeah, or there's the type three fun where you're – where when you're doing it, you're wondering why you did it. When you are when you get back, you're like, I'm never doing that again. And after reflection, it's like, I can't even believe I got through that. That's crazy. So there's a lot of different there, – there's there's other levels to that as well. Yeah. What uh, what trips have you done that, that gave you that feeling, <laughs> type 3 fun? You know, I, I think um, a, any trip on the Arctic Ocean, realistically, not the last degree trips because that's just a week-long, pretty straightforward lo- from a logistical perspective and, and just kind of like stress and safety. But the bigger North Pole expeditions, uh, I've done three of those, uh, the first ever summer expedition in the North Pole and then another expedition in 2010 and then 2014 which was an unsupported uh, north pole expedition um those are just there's so much uncertainty and every single part of that trip is uncomfortable like it's not even like being in a tent is comfortable um you know every aspect of it is really hard and that's a journey where um you're of course i went back so maybe it's not accurate but uh that's just a very difficult environment to be in for that amount of time and then we've done um uh, actually, one of the part guys that I do a lot of expeditions with, we were in 2015 in Nepal doing a first ascent, um, and there was definitely an area there where I was like, I'm outside of my comfort zone. I have two kids, um, and so I was just like, I don't know if this is the best thing for me to be doing right now. Mm. So the 2014 to the North Pole, is that the one that you wrote the book about on thin ice? Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, and can you explain that? So you were 500 miles, you went 500 miles across frozen ice that was melting or yeah i mean the the, so you know a a great way to understand the arctic ocean and the north pole is to really contrast it with antarctica and so antarctica is a continent and all the snow and ice is ice that's basically fairly stable It's, it's ice sheet so it's moving but not very much and um so skiing to the south pole you're seeing over this pretty stable piece of ice and and actually, at the South Pole, the elevation is around uh, 9,300 feet. Um, that's how much ice. There's almost two miles of ice at the South Pole. Oh, damn. The Arctic Ocean, on the other hand, is just ice that's floating on water. Um, and so, therefore, at its thickest point, it maybe only gets now about four or five feet thick. And it's a very dynamic uh, place. So because the ice is floating on water, it's not very thick. The ocean currents, the winds, the tides are constantly affecting that ice. So it's breaking apart and creating open sections of water that are called leads. It's colliding together, forming what looks like a mountain range made out of ice. Those are called pressure ridges and just kind of everything in between. And there's a general drift to the ice too, which is pushing you backwards as you tra- tra- travel northward. Mm. And so the, the kind of traditional expedition, um, even from historically, is leaving from land to get to the North Pole. Um, and so we left from a place called Ellesmere Island, Cape Discovery, the northernmost point of land in North America, and it's roughly a journey of about 500 miles in a straight line, but you're winding around all that ice and, and getting pushed back as you, you know, we would go to sleep at night and sometimes lose upwards of two miles of our forward progress. Oh, so damn. it's like you're traveling on a conveyor belt and, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting environment. And then you know, so the ice is breaking up, and as time has passed, you know, you, the, the extent of ice is is much different than it used to be, and the thickness is much less. And so the dynamics are changing as we're doing it. 
Mm. Um, and so realistically, that trip will probably be the last ever land and North Pole expedition. And, and that was on it's 500 miles one way? Yeah, yeah. We got picked yeah. up at the North Pole uh, by a plane kind of right at the end of our limit uh, of when those plans can, planes can fly and land. So it was a very, it's very stressful because we were also traveling in, in a style which is called unsupported and unaided. So we're bringing all of our supplies with us. And that's a really interesting aspect to modern adventuring that we don't always think about. Even something like Ever- someplace like Everest, you're only on the mountain for like 12 days. You come back, you break you know, a shoelace, you can have somebody run down or fly one up from Kathmandu and you can have a shoelace in two days. You know, Not mm. that you couldn't fix a shoelace, but uh, on, on a trip like that, everything that we need to live and survive for nearly two months we're carrying with it us so one it's really heavy our sleds weighed 325 pounds each and then two there's a lot of planning and thoughtfulness that goes into what do we take what proportions you know how much food how much fuel because like on day 30 we can't call somebody and just say hey can you bring us some fresh bananas because we'd like to eat a banana no it doesn't work that way Mm. so it's it becomes this bigger issue of just like um like i said a little bit of a chess game of how all these things play out and how does your travel strategy work and your supplies and things like that yeah so i do not want to compare anything i've ever done to that but (laughs) for the sake of comparison i was just talking to dean carnassus last week about uh ultra marathoning and about how we tend to do aided ultra marathons but this uh you know unaided is becoming this like new thing in adventure where a lot of people and i'm like starting to get that itch where i want to start doing things where maybe you're a little bit more out in the wild and you have there is no like going back there is no save me yeah yeah i think that's an interesting conversation because it involves a couple different aspects of where adventure is right now one it's and i think about this personally as where's the leading edge and the reality is is you know we've been everywhere we've done everything so part of that leading edge is trying to take traditional adventures and doing them in a harder style and i think that's really compelling because that requires more effort it requires more um you know independence like you said it requires just more preparation and there's no there's not as much a safety net so i really like that aspect of adventure the other thing about the self-supported nature of it is it just again kind of requires more planning and you have to be more uh, self-reliant more resilient and you know one of the things I often say about being successful is you, you kind of have to put yourself in a situation where you don't have another choice and right. pretty quickly you realize you can be successful I think everybody has that in them they just don't realize it because we have all these safety nets around us and rip cords or whatever it is um, and so that self-supported style I think really fits me and my kind of overall life's philosophy, but I also think it's cool in terms of kind of where the nature of adventure is evolving. Mm, It's kind of that Cortez philosophy, you know, burn the ships. There's only forward, right? Yeah, seriously, yeah, yeah. And there's merit to that, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about adventure then because clearly, uh, you know, I'm curious is how do you pick what you're going to do next because, like you said, we really have been anywhere. you just, like, really trying to get creative to figure out those new kind of human powered expeditions or yeah I mean that's the long and short of it I would say I'm still looking for those few places that people haven't been and there's not a lot Um, but you know for example like in 2015 there was an area in Nepal that had gotten opened up to climbing that had been previously closed and you saw a bunch of climbers go in there and try to nab these first ascents and that's Mm -hmm. really cool because you know, even for our trip, which, which wasn't like the craziest objective uh, of of the range in, where we were, but you know, at a certain point, there's only so much that you can plan. You know, I have this other motto on our trips: is like, let's just go up, let's just go up there and see what happens. And so, uh, so that's a, a big part of it for me. And and you know, not to get too much on a tangent of that trip, but you know, that was really fun for us as well as a big challenge because we went up into the area where we had looked at on maps and whatever, and we kind of established this route that we're going to go after two failed attempts. Finally, we came back down and we circled around and found a way better route than what we had anticipated just from our maps and our research. Hmm. Um, but I think for me personally, what I'm trying to do is, yeah, just try to, I, I kind of just reflect on what I'm doing. I mean, obviously I like the cold weather style of trips. And so, um, you know, as I travel around or as I pour over maps, um, it's just trying to figure out what place would I be interested in learning more about. 
um, and what would be a unique challenge and, you know, a little bit of what hasn't been done in that particular realm. Is it a speed thing? Is it a self-supported thing? Is it a particular route within that area? Um, and, and now it's even just trying to do some other fun adventures and combining different things. That's part of that leading edge. I have a trip coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, not necessarily a cold trip, but we're going to bike, hike and paddle across Colorado from one, from the Eastern border, the Western border. So totally arbitrary parameters, but that makes it a unique adventure to us. And, you know, we have a kind of a time deadline that we need to finish because one of the guys needs to pick up his kids. Hmm. Um, and so now we have a really compelling adventure that hasn't been done before. And it's just because we were like, okay, we're going to start biking at this border of Colorado and we're going to end at the Western border of Colorado paddling. So that's kind of where I'm at, uh, with deciding those, but it, you know, it, 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 for coming back from a big trip, like, you know, everything's evolving. Back in the day, we would spend like three years focused on one particular adventure and planning and preparing it. And that's when, you know, like 2006, we did the first ever summer expedition to the North Pole. And that simply was just like figuring out the, what gear we needed to use. So I, I like that part of it too, but it's more challenging, you know, when you're kind of doing these unique things, there there haven't been a lot of, there's not a lot of resources or there's not other people to ask. And that's, a disadvantage at time, but it's also the thing that I find most interesting or, or kind of my own personal challenge in it. When you're on these guided tours, do you ever uh, say, oh, let's just go up there and see what happens and then just look back <laughs> at people and wait for them to wonder what the hell they signed up for? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that people um, are, you know, kind of are like this with their eyes. Yeah. And, and I think that's natural. I think, you know, people's perceptions about the cold for one, uh, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the cold. I think being in a tent in extreme situations is very intimidating to people. I think, uh, actually I got a funny story about Colin. We were, uh, we were skiing, I, I was skiing at the North pole and I was coming up to a crack in the ice that had kind of refrozen. And, um, I was checking it out and I was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Everybody, we're going to take off our skis or you're going to keep your skis on, get across. And I'm going to help the sleds come down and come up because the, when the ice is thin, it could be real fragile. The saltwater ice is much different than freshwater ice. Mm. And, um, so I, I kind of got, took off my gear, took off my skis, I got in there and then I was helping my first client across. And then she got up on the other side and I was, I kind of grabbed her sled like this. And as I did that, I broke through the ice and I basically like was falling into the water and I lunged to the other side. I kind of caught the edge with my elbows and was just like screaming to get pulled up. And, um, and it was like 30 below or whatever. And maybe it was 20 below. It wasn't that cold. And, uh, mm, so debatable. she turned around luckily and pulled me up, basically kind of saved my life. And, but I've been in that experience like quite a few times. And so I just rolled around in some snow, kept going. And, and Colin was like, this just got real. Is what he said to me. And I yeah. was like, this has been real the whole time. You just have been unaware of the fact that this is what this environment is like. So knowledge is power, but ignorance is bliss, at, you know, at a certain point. Yeah. Well, and you know what the thing is, too, is I think in Western society and Western culture, everything is very controlled, right? Like there are litigation and we have insurance and like there's a lot of things you can't do. Even if you go to a third world country and you do something a little bit adventurous like zip lining, it's going to be yeah. way more gnarly than it is in the U.S. because yeah, We're so totally. fucking controlled. So then yeah. I, I'd imagine when you get in the wild, like where there's really nothing, it's a whole different mindset. Yeah, shift. yeah, and it takes a, a mindset. You know, part of what I try to do when I guide is is try to teach the mindset of being aware of your surroundings and your environment. Because what happens is, just like with that crossing that ice, you know, every second the conditions are changing and you're changing, and so it's this constant back and forth of like, how am I doing right now? What's happening with the weather? Do I, do I, you know, is it status quo or do I need to, you know, do something else? Do I need to put on another jacket or do I need to undress a little bit or whatever so I'm not too hot? And so that's a huge thing that I try to focus on because I think the biggest survival situations happen or kind of dangerous situations when people go into an environment and they just, oh, I've been in snow before, so I'm just going to do this when, you know, there could be, you know, two or 50 other variables that are affecting this particular situation because it's so unique. Mm. Um, but it's, but it is that being constantly vigilant that I try to, to do because yeah, in our society, we kind of get used to things working and all these systems and you know, just everything. 
Yeah, and it's like when it doesn't work, it's like who do I sue or how like you can't yeah. do that, right? And it's like, yeah. well, yeah. Mother Nature doesn't and, give a fuck. Yeah, and that's and that's the other. You know, I I always say like exhibitions are really like great teachers, and they have some very beautiful, elegant lessons that they that that they impart, whether you want to learn them or not. And you know, this idea of being self sufficient and taking care of yourself and 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 kind of becoming comfortable with risk and uncomfortness and you know all these things and and uh it's it for me it's fun to be able to at one part do kind of my own adventures and really push the the limits on those but then also bring back to some of these shorter trips uh those lessons and help people or not necessarily help them but remind them that those things exist and they can function within those parameters somewhat comfortably right yeah i'd imagine that it makes people feel much more capable just in everyday life oh yeah yeah i call it polar swagger you know like i do i do another training course uh in canada and i'm always like after the end of it i'm like you guys you can walk straight into the bar you order a beer you know uh everybody's just gonna stand with their jaws open and you know like go up and want to shake your hand or whatever but it does You, you like it's this there's also this directness that you live with you know and so um all those other layers in our life are separated away and so if i do this this happens you know and so you get you feel very empowered after an experience like that and it's great it's 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 a i think it's very valuable to have that feeling Mm. so your lifestyle is so much different than anybody else's maybe that i've ever met so uh (laughs) What was the catalyst for this kind of a lifestyle? Were you adventurous as a kid growing up? Did something happen? I mean, what is it that gets you into? I know, you know, Edmund, uh, was it Sir Edmund Hillary, one of the first guys to, was he Summit Everest, I think, without yeah. oxygen, right? No, and, he was just the first. The first summit, first guy. right? Yeah. And they asked him why, and he's credited with saying, like, because it was there. And so I'm always curious, like, what is it that got you into this lifestyle? Yeah, I, you know, I wish I, I, I feel like I have it not never a good answer for that one. And I wish I had like this specific moment. And honestly, for me, I've always just loved being outside. And I, I always joke like I wanted to be a professional camper when I was a kid, because I just I, I love camping. Nailed it. And and <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that job never really existed. But, you know, I was just someone who grew up with a desire to be outside and, and a desire to go on adventures. And I grew up in Wisconsin. And there wasn't, as it is today, this big, you know, there wasn't a path, like there wasn't a lot of organizations, there wasn't anybody like, hey, you can be a, a sponsored athlete or whatever, there, there was nothing like that. And so I was just trying to be outside and do as many things as I could. And, you know, it didn't always work out. And, you know, as I got to be an adult and kept trying in different ways and, and kind of coming up to things that didn't work and almost gave up, but kept with it long enough that, you uh, uh, I was able to to do it, but ultimately it's just a love of being outside. And and as I started doing bigger cold weather expeditions, just this really interest in these in trying to work out these bi- bigger physical and mental problems, not only prior but also on the trip. Because there's this, you know, when you get to that point and you push through, it's it's really empowering. Yeah. What was your first one? What was the first like big one where you're like, okay. Um, well, I had done, I had been doing a bunch of dog sledding expeditions in like the early 2000s, but, but realistically, uh, we started planning for the first ever summer North Pole expedition and, and we started planning in 2002, made an attempt in 2005, didn't make it. And then finally were successful in 2006. And that was like, I was like, all right. Uh, and from there I was like, okay, I can, I think I can try to make this a full-time thing. And it, it was like not totally full-time and I was, you know, cleaning chimneys and bartending and you name it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, just trying to, you know, and, and so many times just being like, what am I doing? Like, this is not going to work out. But I, I you know, I, I honestly think one of the things that separates success from from not success is just that persistence. Yeah, and do you um, think that's what it is? That I think that's one of, I think that's one of the things. I think for me it's, it's that I was – willing to to do without a lot like sacrifice you know any sort of financial gain any Mm -hmm. sort of personal stability a house you know i lived on a beach on lake superior for a summer and in shacks and and then i also think you have to have some talent you know and some smarts so you've got to be able to put some of those things together in a compelling way um so i I, you know it's a few things 
Yeah, sure. and I, I think that's cool because, you know, there's a lot of people that might not want to go 500 miles across uh, thin ice, but, you know, they do want something, and so that's a, a life lesson. It's like, dude, if you can make it doing that, I mean, you oh, can yeah, basically do whatever you want. <laughs> it's true, and you start to realize that, you know, like I do a lot of presentations and corporate things, and it's not like I set out to be like this guy that's doing that stuff, but you start to reflect on some of these experiences and you realize, like I said earlier, there's a lot of incredible lessons that I've learned. And I give myself the pep talk all the time or my wife, when we're talking about things, I'm just like, Hey, well on this expedition, I did this and I think it could apply here. And she's like, okay, yeah, yeah I get it. Right, right. Turn <laughs> but it <off>. it's true. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so how, okay. So you have a family, you have a wife and two kids. Yep. So how, yep. uh, how is that dynamic? How is it leaving for expeditions? Do you think that, I mean, yeah. obviously they support you, but I'm, I'm curious about that, that side of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it's getting harder. My kids are, uh, five and two and a half. And, and so they're getting to the point now where they're just fun to be around all the time. And, um, you know, I think about them a lot on the trips and so being gone, uh, it's not easy, you know, it's not easy. And, I feel like the kids and expeditions are things that pull me in exact opposite directions. Mm. But, you know, I also have the opportunity to be around them all summer long, which is my slow season and things like that. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a constant back and forth. I love, I I always say like, I love being a dad. Like I wouldn't change that for the world. And, um, you know, hopefully what I do allows them to understand the world a little better and allows me some time when I'm home to be a hundred percent focused on them versus not. Um, but it's a, it's an evolving thing and, and <laughs> we'll see how, where it goes. Right. Right. Well, I think that's cool because, you know, when you're growing up, you learn about explorers, like your dad's not an explorer, <laughs> right? Like that'll be a cool yeah. experience that they have. And honestly, <laughs> like probably them growing up, I, I would imagine, their frame of reference is going to be so wide open. Like they're going to feel like they can do a lot of things. So, yeah. And I, you know, I've, it's funny because, you know, my dad was definitely into the outdoors and nature and I inherited a lot of that. And, and I want, I obviously it's very important to me. I want to pass that down to my kids, but I also want them to, you know, be able to discover whatever their own thing is. But I do think like, you know, achieving hard things is a, is a good, um, kind of thing to witness on a regular basis so that right, they're right. With that um and and so that if they do want to do something hard in whatever capacity it is um that they they, they don't have self-doubt or hesitation or whatever it ends up being yeah i mean a lot of i mean there's a lot of people a lot of people that have a worldview that just makes them feel incapable of doing these things it's, so yeah yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit specifically about the business, about how you've been able to make this your thing. So I know that you do guided tours and you do, I saw like a really cool photo class, like in Nepal. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what does the business look like? Yeah. I mean, it's evolving and I always say like everything I could do goes away tomorrow, but I got lucky, you know, I, I, uh, have been doing kind of adventures and expeditions for almost 20 years now. And so I was around before social media existed and, and, um, you know, again, because my sport is probably on the more boring side of any sort of extreme thing, I've always focused more on stories and lo and behold, as the world changed around me, stories became more relevant. And, um, so I've been able to leverage that in a lot of ways. Obviously I have a lot of great sponsors that I work with. Um, I do a lot of photo and video work, which is also directly evolved from expeditions and me just trying to simply document what we're doing. And so photography has become a really, not only a big, uh, hobby of mine, but also a really important part of my business as well as sponsorship model as, and videography too. Um, the guiding, uh, where I, I was a guide way back in the day, like a whitewater guide and a dog mushing guy. And I was like, I'm not doing another day of guide and I can't stand it. No way. Right. And a bunch of years ago, I got asked to guide a trip to the South pole and I just really rediscovered that aspect of my life and, and kind of shifted a little bit more to my style versus, um, you know, maybe in a situation where I'm cooking everybody dinner and, you know, laying their bed out, we're more of a team and I'm teaching these people and, and, and I'm sharing my experience with them. And it's become a really rewarding experience for me, 
um, because I've been able to, you know, like Colin and many other people, I've become very good friends with my clients because we're really just like, you know, kind of learning from each other and traveling together and everybody's doing, uh, uh, an ample part of their, of the, of the work. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. That's a job, but doesn't oftentimes seem like a job. Mm. Um, so that's the, the guiding has become a really big part of what I do. So, um, you know, I do a polar training course in Canada I do a lot of these shorter trips again, like what Colin did to the North Pole or South Pole. And then I'm kind of also doing some more Colorado based, just shorter, like winter camping things and, and, uh, winter bike packing trips as well. And then there's a lot of, uh, like public speaking as well. And then I, every once in a while, I have a few writing projects that I'm working on, obviously the book, but I'll write some articles for outside or somebody else when I kind of get some ideas. I really like being involved in this adventure space and not just doing trips, but also kind of understanding where it's leading and commenting on it and, and, you know, both the positive and the negative aspects of it so that we can hopefully all have a better understanding of what's going on and appreciate it more. Mm, That's cool. If somebody's listening to this and they do have the inclination to go to the North or South Pole, like how much, what can somebody expect to pay for an expedition like that? What's the well, barrier to entry here? Uh, yeah, it's it's expensive. I mean, the logistics are crazy. I mean, a last degree North Pole trip, you're looking at around forty five thousand dollars, not including the gear. Uh, South Pole's considerably more expensive. It's about close to eighty thousand, seventy five thousand um, dollars, and that's basically a week on the ice. But the logistics for both of those trips are are prohibitively expensive. Hmm. That said. Uh, that trip is a dream for many people. It's an incredible adventure. Um, you know, being at the North Pole or the South Pole is an amazing experience. Um, so I've had, I've had, I, and like, and I've had a lot of great people come through, and we've spent a lot of fun time on the ice, and you know, decent conversations in the tent. So it's it's good. Nice. Yeah, Southwest doesn't have the want to get away to the North Pole. No, I mean the logistics are crazy. Our North Pole logistics, you're just like it's a, it's a a Russian logistics company that we work through, and I don't know if you've ever spent any time in Russia, but the, you know, the Russia model is like everything is from like 1950, and it's like big levers like this, and Damn. you know it's it's just crazy, but uh, um, it's also really unique, you know, and you get to understand a little bit more of a, a different culture as well. Yeah, get that Soviet innovation. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the, there's the not true thing, but it's like Americans spent, you know, however many million dollars to get a pen that wrote pencil that wrote in space or something, something that wrote in space and pen that wrote in space and the Russians just use a pencil. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, w- I want to talk about something real quick is so I was reading a little bit uh, about your book, and so they think, or you said even on this interview, that you think that will be the last, uh, that last time that that's possible, and you think that's because of climate change. Uh, yeah. So a lot of people hear about climate change, and unfortunately, it's become politicized. And I think, including myself, like I look at it, and I'm like, I really don't know. Like it, it's hard, people don't understand the science behind it. I'm yeah. curious, from your point of view, since you've been doing these expeditions, has it been noticeable? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I have probably more like boots on the ground experience on the Arctic Ocean than anybody in modern history. You know, my first trip and attempt in 2005 to being at the North Pole last year, 2017. Um, You know, that's over a decade. Mm -hmm. And just the character and the nature of the ice is really different. Um, You know, we used to see these big pans that we could ski across for like big flat sheets of ice that we could ski across for like two hours. And then in 2014, it's just, you know, small sheets and really rough ice. So just the extent of ice is, is much different and the thickness and you can see that manifest itself in just the surface conditions and the overall drift and, um, those types of characteristics. So it's, it's definitely different. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only person that's witnessed that our logistics company, Basically, they ceased flying operations because they don't feel they can't find any places that they can land a plane anymore. And mm. and the, the, the thaw is coming much earlier than it used to. So they used to fly into June or July. And, you know, for our trip in 2014, they're like May 4th, we're stopping. Um, so, I mean, there's just uh, general climate uh, conditions that are changing there as well. And, and the people who are up there are like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why you're arguing this. Right, you know, really? We, 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 we're, we're watching it happen firsthand. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, I think uh, the very first time anything came out about climate change, it was like in a political forum. 
which I think probably didn't do it a ton of justice for the overall um, appeal or argument of it. Uh, but that's like a good thing to know, right? Because like I said, I can look at the science all day and I'm like, well, I don't really understand it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because for every, yeah, I mean, you can a... prove anything with a study, right? So for every proof, there's, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely been politicized and, and ultimately like, you know, for me, it's it's uh, it's something that I've been involved in a long time, and I'm I'm more than happy to add my two cents to the to the issue. But it is important for people to realize that you know we have a direct impact on that place for sure. Yeah, sure. Are you on the cover of your book? Your cross country skiing is that? Uh, but I know that you do the fat tire bike thing. Is that, what is what are the treks typically entail? Uh, the um, yeah, the North Pole treks are either skiing. And I call it skiing, but we're really just walking with skis on our feet. Um, you know, there's skins on there because we're just trying to get enough traction that we can pull our sleds. Mm. Uh, but uh, or snowshoeing in the really rough ice. And then sometimes we even have to put on a dry suit and swim across open sections of water. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. And that's that can be pretty intense as well. And the fat biking is is more in Antarctica and um, kind of in the Canadian Arctic and then around Colorado. Mm. What about the wildlife out there? Is that is that something you're contending with as well? Yeah, I mean, we have had, I mean, I've had a lot of uh, close encounters with polar bears over the years. So, um, yeah, there, there isn't a ton of wildlife in those places. We're definitely in, in some of the more extreme places. Um, but, you know, the Arctic Ocean, polar bears are all, all over. Um, and they're wandering around looking for seals. And so 2000. 14, we had a couple bears sneak up behind us um, and get to about 15 feet from us. So that was a little scary. We've had polar bears jump on our tent before while we were sleeping in it. And uh, Wait, hold on. Don't breeze by that. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they're, they're, looking for, they're looking for food. And um, they're wandering around. And they see, you know, a, a tent with two stinky guys in there. And it's like two two all beef patties and the tent is like a, a wrapper, you know? Right, right. Um, so they're trying to figure it out and they, they actually kill baby seals by like jumping on like ice when they're kind of in these ice layers or these kind of like caves underneath the ice and so they'll smash them. We figured that's kind of what it was doing on our, the front of our tent. So we woke up in the middle of the night and tent's kind of down like this and right away we realized what was going on and we're able to scare it away though, luckily. Is that how you how you get away? Like you scare it? Uh, yeah, we have flares, uh, small little flares that are called uh, pencil flares, and then we also do carry a gun, which I, we, you know, we've, and I'll put some cracker shells in there first. Um, but that's a, a super a good way. Each bear is a little different, but um, um, basically, uh, yeah, we've been able to scare them away in, in one way or another. Mm. Have you read uh, Endurance, the book about the Shackleton expedition? Oh yeah. Okay. Definitely. So in that book, he talks about leopard seals. Yeah. Which forever yeah. scared me of leopard seals. <laughs> Is that a thing yeah, that you like, encounter? Yeah. yeah no, we, they're not. The, leopard seals don't live in in the Arctic and in Antarctica. I've been. I haven't really been around that area. That's the edge, like where the ice shelf goes in the water, and I'm more in the interior. Okay. But I, I have this. I have a very similar fear of leopard seals, and there's also some like killer whale stories of some other Antarctic old expeditions where the whales are like coming up and trying to figure out where they are as they're like loading stuff off their ship onto an iceberg or whatever. Mm. So yeah. Anyways. Damn. I've, and so, and so the biggest fear is polar bears. And cause like you'd mentioned getting in the water and going across. Yeah. Yeah. We're always kind of on a constant vigilance for, for polar bears. We've seen some seals, not leopard seals, but like bearded seals or whatever. And, that's been a little nerve wracking because you don't really know what's going to happen there, but they've just been more curious about what we're doing and, and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Seals seem like they're cute because they kind of seem like dogs, <laughs> but like I was diving with a whole bunch of seals barking at me and I was like, this is unnerving. Like, Oh yeah. I can imagine. I, yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, yeah, you, you're like, Oh, I've never heard of a seal attack, but then you're in the situation where you're like not in your normal environment and you're in their environment and you're right. like, okay, what what pisses a seal off? Like right. any anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, I think it the, the crazy part is when you're confronted with anything in nature like that, you just realize how powerless human beings are without all of our gadgets and all the shit yeah. we've created. Yeah. 
You're just totally. you're back into the middle of the food chain at that point. Yeah, they, there's a great uh, Dennis Miller line, and and it's even even the lion, the king of the jungle, is a penguin's bitch in Antarctica. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's there's, true. That's those it. Those right animals, there. and that's how and that's how we feel. It's funny because that's how we feel in the Arctic. You know, we see polar bear tracks, and and they're sleeping on the ice. They they get into these leads and just swim across effortlessly, shake their fur off, go about it a day. I mean, it takes us an hour to do that. And we have, you know, our sled, our Kevlar sleds, our, you know, our high tech tracking satellite equipment, this waterproof shot, you know, it's yeah. crazy. So, you know, obviously we have a lot of other benefits as humans, but you really see how perfectly adapted some of these animals are to these environments. And it's really, it's really cool to, to see that. Hmm. And do your sleds float? They do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they're designed to be able to float and sometimes we'll actually catamaran them. We'll put two of them side by side and use our skis to hold them together. And then we'll, we'll kind of paddle or shuttle across some of those open sections of water. Hmm. Okay. What does the training look like in your everyday lifestyle so that you're capable of doing these things? Yeah. I, I mean, I have an overall philosophy, which is train hard, travel easy. And so I'm kind of always trying to maintain a basic level of fitness. Like I said earlier, I'm not like the fittest man on earth by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and just kind of running the business of all this stuff takes up a lot of time. Um, so I try to maintain just a basic level of, of fitness through mostly a lot of biking, um, as well as just kind of hiking and, and kind of general adventure things. Um, but I try to get out, you know, uh, in a busy time, a couple, at least a couple hours a day. Um, so I'm on the bike a lot, uh, mm -hmm. in the summer, just mountain bike all the time, which I love. And it's just a great all body workout. Um, once we start focusing on a bigger objective, then we're getting, I'm getting more into like specific training. And so once you have a goal, for example, yeah, for example, for something like a uh, North pole expedition, um, we'll, I'll do, I'll keep doing a lot of biking. I'll do a lot of strength endurance training. I'll get a backpack full of rocks and start hiking, you know, living in Colorado, it's really easy to get both altitude and strength training. So just hiking with weighted packs. Um, and then I do a lot of, um, just kind of similar activities. So we'll like I uh, pulling tires. So I have my normal harness and we'll pull a couple of truck tires, um, just around the gravel trails and do some workouts based around those as well as just some kind of more CrossFit style stuff with the tires, flipping them, throwing them over our shoulder, tossing them, running with them. Um, and then just a few other little core things. Hmm. Um, as well. yeah, I'd imagine but, on these, Oh, sorry. Uh, it's, it's, it can be hard to balance all the stuff, you know? Y yeah. Cause I've got with some of my teammates, you're like, cause you're focused on fundraising and, you know, getting the gear and the train and you, know, you have this conversation. Well, if we don't have the money. We don't go. That's yeah, true. But if our bodies don't work, we're not going either. So you right. kind of have to divide up that time into equal parts. And no one of those things is any less important. Yeah, it, it's amazing. I noticed this myself. Like when you start a business, even if it's rooted in adventure and fitness, it's like it's hard to hang on to your own fitness in the meantime. Yeah, and then throw two kids into that and it's even harder. Oh, um, but, but, you know, it's you also realize, like, like I was saying, it's a, it's an important part of it. And so like I build that t time into my day. Like after I'm, after we get done here, I'm hopping on the bike and going riding, you know, it's just like, I can't not do it. And you know, as I get older, I get out of shape quicker and it takes me longer to get in shape. You know, I was on book tour last fall and I was like, Oh my God. Um, so it's, you know, I'm focused on it not only for an expedition side of it, but also just for a personal lifestyle. And and I feel like, you know, I have more energy when I'm working out regularly and all these other things. But it, it there's not enough hours in the day, that's for sure. Yeah, and I, don't, I mean, I can imagine if things go sideways while you're out there, uh, your fitness could absolutely save your life or not. Oh, yeah. And if you look at these, I mean, it's, it's not only it's the fitness and nutrition and overall understanding of how your body works, you know, like it's it's a battle of attrition out there. And, you know, we have to be mentally sharp. Uh, quite often and and make good decisions and and we have a lot of stress and anguish and then we're under physical strain and so there's no question that your physical ability to perform is directly connected to your mental ability to, to be strong and so those things are so intertwined that it's for me really hard to separate them and and again knowing what your body can do like 
it's one thing to be tired, but it's another thing to be like, oh yeah, I've been in this situation before, or my body has felt like this before, I got two hours left. Or, you know, I've been in this situation before and I need to stop right now and eat something, or I, or we're done for the day, I can't go on, you know. But having that frame of reference ahead of time because you've done enough training, um, I think is, is uh, super crucial to not only being successful, but just basic survival. Right, right, yeah, absolutely. Um, is there, well actually, what has been the... I guess hardest and or gnarliest, scariest, whatever word you want to use there, experience that you've had where you're like, maybe I'm not coming out of this or Yeah. I, I feel like I try to be somewhat safe. You know, we we have these uh we have a saying that we always say it's like decisive, confident, and safe. Um, so when we're in these environments where we're dealing with like all this uncertainty and we have to make a lot of these decisions like very quickly, like we're just like, okay. There's a lot of crappy decisions, but we still need to be decisive about it because, like, at a certain point, you got to make the best crappy decision, and then you got to be confident in there to allow you to move forward. Then our overall umbrella is safe, so we're always trying to be safe, you know, no matter what. So I try not, I try to like not go to that edge as as much as I can. But there there have been enough times where you're just like, wow, that was a close call. Whether it's like an avalanche, you know, in the mountains, or you know, falling through the ice. I mean, I literally almost killed my partner on the North Pole. I was encouraging him to go across this thin ice section of ice, and he fell in, and I was far enough away with more thin ice in between us that I was completely helpless to to, to get him out. And luckily, he was able to get himself out. But, you know, I was the person who was like, go across here, you know? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, just do it. Oh, <laughs> you know? my God. And, uh, you know, he handled it super well but you know that was a very scary situation and there's a lot of other situations where you're just like oh that was close and if you dwell on it you just shut down and so you just kind of got to do a little you know gallows humor and just be like ha 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 that was funny right uh, that's and then keep going you know yeah. so there's there's a lot of those falling through the ice i think the polar bear encounters you know like when we had two polar bears kind of come up behind us in 2014 tried to scare them away, shot off our flares that kept coming. And then we were relaying sled. So we just had one sled. Um, and luckily it was the sled, my sled that had the gun in it, because if we would have been pulling my partner Ryan's sled, uh, there's no gun in that sled, you know, we'd be inside the polar bear belly right now. So that's, those are situations where you're like, ah, yeah, that was, that was kind of close. But like I said, you just kind of, you know, we don't have another choice but to keep moving forward. So we try to push it out of our minds and, and keep going. Hmm. Uh, so you've stood on the tallest mountain in the world. Uh, you've gone to the edges of the world. What, which one's harder, going to the poles or going to? Uh, I, I think the north, the full North Pole expedition is easily one of the most difficult adventures on the planet by hmm. far. There's just so much uncertainty. Uh, you know, just being in the tent is hard. Um, you know, like I said, we those our trip. 325 pound sleds. I mean, we averaged two point, a little under three miles a day for oh. three, three weeks. Damn. I mean, and there was days where we went a mile. I mean, we could almost see our last campsite. So it's, it's, it's hard to, de it's hard to, to describe what that adventure is like. And that's why I'm glad that I have that book out because it offers me the opportunity to really, uh, connect with people at that place because the arctic ocean is such people get everest you know there's enough stuff about everest and even antarctica like you mentioned shackleton mm -hmm. um but uh it's the arctic is just really abstract and so being able to have that book out allows me to to kind of present some of those stories a little better and then um and then we also actually have uh, a documentary that that's out on that as well um which is Melting. you can get uh, yeah yep okay. uh, last Pole. and that's on uh i think it's on itunes and amazon you can look it up and uh and that was really cool uh, that said we filmed all that ourselves so that added a whole nother level to that trip which just made it a lot more difficult right yeah so we'll have both of those linked up in the show notes of this episode for people that are listening both the book and the documentary okay. um yeah. that makes it real makes me realize the uh the the gravity of what you said earlier when you said at night sometimes you would go back two miles I'm like, oh, well, two miles. But when you're talking, that's your whole day. That's a big deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And when you're, again, that's in the context of this really finite amount of food and fuel and, you know, this kind of hard stop date of, like, the plane's picking us up because they're not flying. And, and it doesn't matter where we are. They're picking us up. And 
the logistics are ridiculously expensive. I mean, pick getting picked up from the North Pole on our own is over a hundred grand. And so, you know, there's a and we didn't have all that money ourselves. We borrowed money from Ryan's brother to, to help pay for that trip. You know, we had sponsors and all this other stuff, but it's not like I'm a gajillionaire. Right. And so there's all these other layers of stress that are going on there. Not only that, you know, we're out there for almost two months. We're by the fortieth day, we have ten days of food and fuel left. And still almost 200 miles to go, like a little less than half the trip in 10 days. Mm. And so you just are dealing with these like overwhelming odds. And yet we kept, you know, kind of going up there and seeing what happens. We're just, we'll make a new plan. And, and, you know, if that doesn't work, we'll make a new plan. And if that new plan doesn't work, we'll make a new, new plan, right. you know. And, you know, eventually we, we made it happen, but it, it, there wasn't one time where we were like, oh yeah, this is awesome. This is the best thing. And so when you look at kind of like modern adventuring, that's really back to that original style of trip where you're on your own, you're making your own luck and it's your planning that's getting into that. Nobody is helping you out. Nobody's carrying your gear. Nobody's setting a route. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, and, and that's the, you know, in hindsight, I guess that's the, I guess the type two fun a little bit right. where you're like, okay, that, that, that was an interesting experience, but there, it took a long time before Ryan and I were like, we're ever going to go back there. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'd imagine, you know, in that situation specifically, and I don't want to give it away cause I'm definitely going to read the book. Uh, but you're faced with a situation where if you try to go harder to make up more ground, you're going to consume more fuel. So you really have to like be very solution oriented in a situation like that. Oh yeah. And that, and, and, you know, you actually hinted on probably one of the biggest stresses for me personally, which was just our fuel, um, because we were running out of fuel by the end of that trip. And that's a thing where you start to do the math on what can happen. And we could call for a plane to pick us up and we could be safe. And, you know, OK, but we could also keep pushing on, but we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if the plane can pick us up right at the end or if you know, we got delayed eight days at the start. The weather's so unpredictable. Mm. You know, they're flying into one of the most dangerous environments around. And so you start to realize, like, I'm, you know, despite all the dangerous physical things, here you're dealing with something that you can, you have complete control over. You can just say, stop, I'm not comfortable with this. Or you can keep going into this crazy amount of unknown. And that was, like, very, very difficult for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I can imagine. Yeah. So the Lionheart Kicker is a final question we ask every guest. If you could give advice and it were guaranteed to be translated into every language and everybody would hear it, what would you tell people? Uh, I mean, I love that question. And I think for me, uh, you know, it's almost like stick the foot in the door because there's so many things. But I think, um, I think the two basic ones would be one, don't be afraid to fail. Um, I think, I feel like I've learned much more from my failures than I have from my successes. And I think that's even more relevant in today's society because we're in a situation where everybody wants to be their perfect self. Everyone, everybody wants to look the best. And, uh, I think like this, this idea of trying something regardless of the outcome is really an important part of a life process as well as a personal process. And you got to be willing to fail to do that. Um, so that's probably my most important piece of advice. I think the other thing would be, you know, be original. I think there's a lot of opportunities to be yourself um, and what and that can manifest itself in whatever way. For me, it's in these trips. You know, I try to do original trips, but I think um, I think when people kind of are true to themselves and tell a real story, I think they're they're better people. People like them more, you know, and then just have a more fulfilled life. Yeah. No, I'm really stoked to actually read your original story. So the book is called <laughs> On Thin Ice. The documentary is Melting, Last Race to the Pole. Eric, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track and delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, 
send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest.